I think this is really um, kind of expected because before the uh, meeting over two days last week, um, both sides give very low expectation. They didn't expect anything to really to conclude uh, any joint uh, statement. So uh, from what I see over the weekend, the Chinese uh, side quite, you know, um, describe a rather positive picture that, you know, uh, the both sides had quite uh, discussed uh, deeply and uh, some um, they meet some agreement, but the others, there is still a lot of difference. For the U.S. side, I think they really ask a lot to reduce the deficit, trade deficit by 2020, uh, 200 billion U.S. dollar. That is really a lot. This is, as um, Yi Gang, uh, central governor of China Bank, Central Bank said, you know, it's a structural because U.S. saving rate is really low and uh, uh, infrastructure is not so well built. So China can't import so much oil and gas from U.S. And what they can import more, um, you know, technology parts, uh, advanced technology, but U.S. does not allow them to, you know, the U.S. company to export to China. So I think it's very, very difficult to reduce um, you know, the trade deficit so uh, abruptly and so sharply. Um, I think it will take time. Both sides will find a solution in the end. But the talk is just started. What is positive from this meeting? I think both sides agree to continue to talk. Let me ask you a little bit about uh, Made in China 2025 then, because how does this sit alongside some of the trade negotiations as China wants to have an edge in technology and there's a trade-off between quantity towards quality? Um, this is very important development strategy for China. They issued Made in China 2025 in 2015 uh, in order to move up the value chain and to overcome the middle income trap. Um, it happened with a lot of emerging markets in the past, like in Latin America. So China does not want to repeat the same mistake. They want to move up the value chain. And the government issued a policy to consider uh, 10 industries as the most important industry for further development. They want to uh, reduce, you know, uh, re um, how to say, the, the dependence on investment, the, dependence on exports. They want to revive more domestic consumption and to uh, advance uh, the, the, you know, advanced technology uh, like, you know, the new uh, energy vehicles, like uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence, like uh, um, uh, the digital commerce, uh, fintech. So all these areas, they want to, to be uh, one of the global leaders. Reading through your fairly extensive report uh, around the ambitions for China, draw some links then for us. ZTE and Huawei are uh, encountering stronger protectionism from the Americans concerned about so-called national security implications. But is there a rationale for the Americans to stifle the ambitions of these Chinese technology companies because it would effectively stop China having an edge when it comes to 5G and automation? Correct. Um, these two companies, they have really ambitions to be market leader or global leader in 5G technology. Uh, I'll give you an example. Huawei uh, spent more than 15% of this uh, revenue in R&D, research and development, and uh, uh, about 10% for ZTE. So they want to be uh, market leader or technology leader globally for 5G. And that, I think, really draw the attention for the, uh, from the U.S. government. They don't want that Chinese, uh, you know, be the leaders and uh, to, because this is the, the key uh, technology to use further data for, you know, AI, uh, ad, ad, uh, artificial intelligence, all these you know, going forward technology that is so important that 5G will play a key role. And uh, uh, that, I think, is a kind of alarm for the U.S. government. government. And that what's happening now with ZTE and Huawei. Hey, everybody, it's Hadley Gamble from our new CNBC Middle East Bureau in Abu Dhabi. Thanks for stopping by. Now to watch more, you can try one of the videos that just popped up on your screen. And don't forget to subscribe.